guys could read along with me as I read. Um, Ephesians verse, chapter 2, verse 1 starts and says this. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. That's right. Um, Heavenly Father God, I just, uh, I thank you for your word. I thank you um, for the opportunity to be able to really just dig into um, these ten verses over the next six weeks. Um, and Lord, I just pray that as we um, as we study your word, as we study um, uh, the theology of our salvation, God, uh, that you would just settle in our hearts what it is that you've done for us. Lord, I pray that you would um, deepen our understanding of the gospel uh, and that it would bring us to praise you all. I just pray that in your name. Amen. Um, so before I jump in here, I did want to just to say that, like, uh, with my last eight weeks of being able to teach you guys, I, like, prayed and prayed and asked so many people what I should teach through and, and tried, to, tried to think through what I wanted to teach you guys, what I wanted to leave with you the most. Um, and after a lot of prayer and a lot of talking to people, um, the, the main thing became the main thing. So I... I decided that what I wanted to leave you guys with was a very deep dive into our salvation and, and how the gospel plays out. Um, and so today, we are talking through chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, so uh, do me a favor, raise your hand if you have ever felt like you were cursed. Anyone? Yeah? Maybe, some of you, okay, well, I have, certainly, and I've said it before, I've been like, oh gosh, I just feel like I'm cursed right now, um, and, and for those of you who have felt this way, or like maybe said this, or heard someone say, say this, uh, you or they probably don't actually believe that you're cursed, right, like when, when someone has the yips in a sport, or you seem to have a string of bad luck, um, or like a black cat walks in front of you, you probably don't actually think that a supernatural power is cursing you so that no matter what you do, things go bad, right? But even though we intellectually know that curses aren't real, as people, we seem to be fascinated with them. Right? Like voodoo is about harnessing the power of curses, we blame the inexplicable deaths of the Kennedy family with a curse. We are all familiar with the Bermuda Triangle because people say that it is cursed. This idea that for no natural reason, but simply because of your location, your lineage, or because you did one thing that you weren't supposed to do, you are doomed to experience supernatural consequences, something that we as people continue to believe in, even if we don't believe in. Right? Most people don't actually believe in curses, but they also kind of do. Okay? And I have a theory on why we do this, on why humankind, for all of human history, continues to perpetuate the existence of curses. Ready? It's because we are cursed. And, and not cursed to believe in curses, but all humankind is under a curse. And being under a real curse makes it natural for us to believe in fake curses. So what is the curse that all people are under? Well, theologically, we call it the curse of original sin. You know, guys, when you or I, when we, when we talk about salvation, and when we say we are saved, or we ask someone else if they've been saved, um, a common response in our cushy Midwestern America is, I have a great life. Why would I need to be saved? 
answer is this curse. The answer is because of the curse of original sin. And so tonight, looking through Ephesians 2, 1, and other parallel verses, we are going to look at what original sin is, who has been cursed by it, and what God has done about it. And my hope is that for everyone here tonight, you would understand how horrible the curse actually is, and also what a gift it is to be saved from it. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to look at, the first big question when talking about original sin is, what is it? Right? What is original sin? Um, now, I'm going to give you a definition, uh, and this definition isn't mine. It's found in the Westminster Confession. And this definition is long and difficult to understand. And so I'm going to give it to you, and then I'll simplify it and give you scriptural proofs for it. Okay? Um, so this is the definition found in the Westminster Confession. Our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan sinned in eating the forbidden fruit. This, their sin, God was pleased, according to his wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purpose to order it to his own glory. By this sin, they, Adam and Eve, fell from their original righteousness in communion with God, and so became dead in sin, and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. There you go. Curse of original sin. Okay, so th this, I think, is the first time that I've ever quoted the Westminster Confession to you. Um, and so before we dig into this, I want to explain a few things about this confession. First, the Westminster Confession of Faith is not divinely inspired. Okay, God did not write it. Um, it's also not infallible. There are parts of it that can be wrong. Um, the Westminster is a book that was written to systematically define Christian theology. Okay, so um, when it comes to a topical study, it's very helpful. The Westminster is not scripture, but it does have at least one biblical proof for every single sentence written in it. And because of that, it is a very helpful resource when theologically defining such as original sin. Okay, so what is actually being said in that definition? Well, I'm going to break it down into two main statements. The first main statement is that the curse of original sin came from Adam and Eve's first sin. The curse of original sin came from Adam and Eve's first sin. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, God tells Adam, and through Adam, tells Eve that they can eat any fruit from any tree in the Garden of Eden, except one. And then God warns them that the day that they eat of it, they will die. And then, in two chapters, sorry, in one chapter, in Genesis 3, Eve is tempted by Satan's lies to eat the fruit so that she could become like God. And so she falls to that temptation and eats the fruit and gives it to her husband, Adam, and he eats the fruit. And then God, being, you know, God, discovers that they have sinned. He catches them in their sin. And so in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, God starts laying out curses as a consequence for their sinful disobedience. He curses the serpent for tempting Eve. He curses the woman for eating the fruit. And he curses the man for listening to his wife. And also eating the fruit. And what we see as God lays out these curses is a consistent refrain. Where he says, because you have done this, because you have sinned, you are cursed. You guys, the curse of original sin named that way because of Adam and Eve's first sin. Their original sin is what brought about the curse. 
Okay, this is the first main thing that we see in the Westminster Confession. The curse came from Adam and Eve's first sin, which we see in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. Now, the second main thing that we see in the Confession is that the curse itself is death. And that death is defined as Adam and Eve falling, falling from their original righteousness and their communion with God. See, guys, their relationship with God was broken. They could no longer be counted as God's children. And this falling from righteousness and communion with God has major ramifications for the man and the woman. That's the second talks about what the death is. Okay? Um, it is huge ramifications for the man and the woman. That for Eve, every good gift she was given by God was corrupted through the curse. The gift of childbearing would bring pain and suffering instead of pure joy. And the gift of her marriage relationship with Adam would now be filled with tension, fighting, and her oppression. Okay, so in effect, death of her relationship with God also led to the death of her joy in childbearing and her joy in marriage. For Adam, every good gift he was given by God would be corrupted through the curse. Working became difficult, and the amount of work Adam had to do produced a disproportionately low amount of so he worked extremely hard, and the ground did not yield a lot of produce. That does not match. <laughs> I was like, wow, they're excited about this curse. Okay, so, so labor became difficult and didn't yield good fruit. Okay? Um, and Adam's life was also cursed. The gift of life that he was given was taken away from him through a physical death. Okay, so in effect, the death of his relationship with God also led to the death of fruitful labor, death of the earth itself, and death of his body. All good things were corrupted by the curse of Adam and Eve's original sin. Now, this might feel harsh, right? I mean, all they did was eat some fruit. And I'll admit, I struggled with this for a very long time. But here's what I want you guys to understand. It's not about the fruit. It's about their disobedience to God. Okay, let me, let me illustrate it this way. If you were in the military, and your commanding officer gave you an order, and then you didn't do it, or if they told you not to do something, and you did that thing, it actually doesn't matter that much what the command was. There will be significant consequences. The consequences equal to disobeying your commanding officer. And the higher ranked your commanding officer is, the greater the consequences will be. Now, most of us understand this power dynamic in human relationships. It doesn't seem strange. It doesn't seem harsh. We see it as just and necessary. Okay, and even if you do think that the consequences are hard, it doesn't actually matter. Because you're not in charge. You're not the one with authority. The commanding officer is in charge, and they have the authority to distribute consequences. So you guys, with the curse of original sin, if we focus on what Adam and Eve did, if we focus on the fact that they just ate some fruit, the curse seems very harsh. But if we focus on who they did it against, the curse actually becomes merciful. Because they didn't just disobey a parent. They didn't disobey a general, a president, or even a king. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They disobeyed the God of life, the creator of all things, the one who formed them out of the dust, the one who breathed life into them and gave them the privilege of reflecting his glory. 
Because even in our human justice system, we understand the importance of obeying authority. And historically, treason, which is what they did, was met with execution or banishment. Because it is just for God to have cursed Adam and Eve with death for their treason against him. But again, God is not only just. He's also merciful. See, God warned them that the consequence for sin was death. And God was not lying. They were cursed with death, which is just. However, out of God's great mercy, he delayed their death. He gave them time. He gave them time to experience the gravity of their sin. He gave them time to repent. And then he gave them time to be forgiven and have their relationship with God restored. God could have just killed them. And it would have been just. But God is just and merciful. So he did both. So guys, the next time that you experience the consequences of the curse of original sin, and you get frustrated. If you get frustrated at Adam and Eve for sinning and cursing you, and you get angry at God for cursing them, and that you have to live with the results of that. I want you guys to remember that the fact that you are alive at all and capable of being frustrated or angry at God is because God gave Adam and Eve mercy instead of giving them the full consequences that their sin deserved. That does kind of bring us to the second question. It was Adam and Eve's sin, right? Why are we cursed by it? And also, who is cursed by it, right? Who is under this curse of original sin? Are, are the unborn cursed by original sin? Are newborn babies cursed? What about children? The mentally disabled? What if you have not consciously sinned yet? Are you under the curse of original sin? Well, looking to the Westminster Confession again, this is what it says about who is under the curse and why. Okay, this is what it says. It says, they, meaning Adam and Eve, being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed and the same death and sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. Okay, so again, I'm going to simplify this for you guys. The simple answer is everyone who is a natural descendant of Adam and Eve is under the curse of original sin. And the reason why is because the curse of sin was not an external punishment so much as a denaturing of who they were. Adam and Eve were not simply killed by the curse. Sorry, I was laughing because it's like, the curse. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so, so Adam and Eve were not simply killed by the curse. Their very nature is changed by it. Okay. Um, they went from being naturally full of life to being naturally full of death. Okay? And so because of their cursed nature, anything that Adam and Eve produced was also full of death. This is what Ephesians 2 verse 1 is saying. It's saying you were dead in your trespasses. Not sick, not dying, dead. Because the curse of sin is death. Guys, and the you here in this verse, the you here is not a general, or it, it is a general you. Okay? It's not speaking about a specific person. It's referring to all people. 
And so implicitly, this verse says that all people, regardless of age, gender, personal health, all of us are dead in our sin, and therefore under the curse of original sin. Okay, but this verse in Ephesians is not the only one that speaks to this. Romans 5.12 says this. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. This speaks to the everyone part of this curse. Okay? And then Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is King David speaking. Okay, And this speaks to the uh, when the curse begins for each person. Um, this is not saying that the mother sinned when King David was conceived. This is saying that King David was under the curse of sin upon conception. Okay? Every person who shares in the nature of Adam and Eve is under the curse of original sin. Which means that the second that you can be called a person from conception, you are dead in your trespasses. You guys, the curse of original sin is not a behavioral curse for you. Not a behavioral curse for me. It has nothing to do with what you and I do. It has to do with who we are. If you are a human in your nature, you are under the curse. Okay, but the seriousness of this condition is often lost on those of us who grow up in the church. See, guys, all of you here are generally good people. Okay, for the most part, you don't live in a lifestyle of sin. I mean, you sin. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you don't sin. But as far as I know, you're not serial killers. Oh. Okay, You're not drug addicts. None of you are in prison right now. You're not fighting in a war you probably have not experienced a lot of death. Guys, if you have been saved, really, what terrible things have you been saved from? Life is pretty good. You know, and if you have not been saved, what terrible things do you need to be saved from? Life is pretty good. Right, most of you have a cushy life and a boring testimony. So salvation, maybe, feels like a small thing or an unnecessary thing. But that's why understanding the curse of original sin is so important for you. Why it's so important for me. Because of all people who have a generally good life are still under the curse of original sin. You see, you don't need to be saved from bad behavior and the consequences of your bad behavior. You need to be saved from death. You are dead in your trespasses. You guys, the wages of sin is death. The consequences of Adam and Eve's sin was death. And it spread to all people. And you and I, we need to understand how bad the curse is so that we can understand how amazing God's mercy is. How incredible it is that God delayed the fulfillment of that curse. Because right now, at this moment, we have only experienced partial fulfillment of the curse. And that is because God is giving you and I time to be saved. To praise Him for our salvation. But the fulfillment is coming. God will rain judgment and death upon everyone who is under the curse of original sin. Every difficulty that you experience 
every relational tension, every grief, every sickness, every fruitful labor is only a partial taste of the curse of original sin. The curse in full is going to be so much worse. And everyone who remains under the curse will have all of the blessings given to them by God stripped away. Why do you need to be saved? Because if you are not, death is coming for you. But here's the good news. Ephesians 2, verse 1, doesn't say you are dead. It says you were dead in your trespasses. The curse of original sin was your reality, but not anymore. That begs the question, okay? If the curse of original sin is death, and all people under the curse, all people are under the curse, but Ephesians 2, 1 says that it is no longer true of you, what has been done about it? And who is Ephesians 2, chapter, verse 1, talking to? Okay, so first, what has been done about it? Well, Jesus' death and resurrection is what has been done about it. You see, guys, all who are born in the nature of Adam and Eve were under the curse of sin. But Jesus, who was born as a man, was not born in the nature of Adam and he was born in the nature of God. Jesus is the only person to be born outside of the curse of sin. He was also born human, which puts him in a very, very powerful position. See, being in the nature of God, he was sinless. He was not under the curse of original sin, and he did not have to sin. Yet, being human, he was also capable of taking on the curse of of humans. He was capable of taking on the curse of man. And so Jesus, as the God-man, was both the cure and the curse for us when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. As we studied this in Galatians, when we were looking at chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree. You guys, when Jesus died on the cross, he became the curse. He put himself under the curse of original sin and bore the consequences in full, which is death. But again, because Jesus is not merely a man, but he is also God, he rose back to life. Three days later. You see, he bore the consequences of our sin and experienced death in full. But because of his divine nature, because he is full of life, he overcame death and he proved that he is the cure for those under the curse of sin when he rose from the grave. This is pointed out in Romans 8. This is 1 through 11. You should read it. It's long, but it's really, really good. Guys, and I'm, I'll just I'll paraphrase it. Okay? To paraphrase Romans 8, verses 1 through 11, it says that when Jesus took on the curse of our sin, he condemned it. He conquered it. And then he freed everyone who believes in him from it. And that answer to the second question. Ephesians 2 verse 1 is speaking to those who have the spirit of Christ living in them. Christians, those who believe in Jesus are no longer under the curse because he has saved us from it. Now, I'm going to 
like make a major oversimplification of what Jesus did here uh, for illustrative purposes. But it's kind of like antibodies, okay? So if we compare the curse of sin to a disease that all people have upon conception and always results in death, okay? Let's call this the sin disease. Then Jesus was born without that disease. He grew up healthy and full of life. But then, he took the disease and injected it into himself. He contaminated himself with the disease and died. Okay, but then, because his blood, which is full of life, it started to fight against that disease. It created antibodies. And Jesus rose back to life. Again, okay, because of this, Jesus' blood has the cure for the sin disease. His blood can kill the sin disease. And so everyone who receives a blood infusion from Jesus is healed and is saved from their sin disease. I know, it's like, it's really bad. But anyway, that's not the point. Guys, why do you guys need to be saved? Because you have the sin disease, right? And only by asking Jesus to save you. With his life giving blood, can you be saved from the curse of sin and death? Is there's, this, there's this quote from the movie Gladiator. I don't know who all has seen it. Um, where uh, Maximus, the, the main character, he says, Death smiles at us all. And all we can do is smile back. Our, which, which is basically saying, You're going to die. You might as well face it without fear, right? And while this is a great quote for a soldier, gladiator, hero, it's like the worst advice ever, okay? Yeah, I mean, death does smile at us all. We are all cursed. But Jesus can save you from it, right? You have another option than just accepting death as a reality. Like, okay, death, sure, that's just what it is, right? And so to end here, this is what I, what I want you guys to do. I want you to reflect on a question. It's a very simple question. I just want you to reflect on this what if question. If you do believe in Jesus, or sorry, if you do not believe in Jesus, I want you to reflect on this question. What if you did? What if you knew that death was not coming for you? What if after you die, Jesus would raise you back to life and bring you into glory for all of eternity with him? What if death did not scare you? If you don't believe in Jesus, do you want to? Ask him to save you from the curse of sin and death. He will give you eternal life. Now, for those of you who do believe in Jesus, what if you didn't? What would it be like if you had no hope of life after death? What if life here on earth best it would ever get? What if you were a slave to sin? What if the greatest comfort you have when faced with death and tragedy was to say, that's just how it is? If you do believe in Jesus, what would life be like if you didn't?
praise you. I praise you for your salvation. I am so thankful that we have another option other than accepting death as reality. Lord, I am so grateful that you did not simply curse us because we deserve it. That you were merciful upon us. That you took the curse upon yourself. That you became the curse for us. And that you save us from it. Lord, I praise you and thank you that by faith alone we can know that we will have everlasting I pray this all in your mighty name.